Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience. As Nicole said, you've got to love technology. And yes, David, we uh, we barely made it in that 15-minute window of time when the professor doesn't show up. The kids can go from class. But we really do appreciate your patience, and we're happy that you're joining us today um, for the Child and Family Learning Network webinar. The Child and Family Learning Network, to give you a background, is comprised of five communities of practice, which includes just-in-time parenting, family caregiving, financial security for all, e-extension alliance for better child care, and the family's food and fitness community of practice. Members of the family's food and fitness community of practice are presenting today's webinar titled Wellness in the Workplace. The purpose of the Child and Family Learning Network is to create a multidisciplinary approach to family and consumer sciences for the nation and the Cooperative Extension Service. You can see on the screen the ways you can connect with us. And we, uh, we recently started a blog, and we are always looking for guest bloggers. So if that's something that interests you, please email me. My email is at the bottom of the screen. And we also hope that you um, share, follow, friend, like us on our social media accounts, and view all of our resources that we have to offer. And if you would, please go to the Learn event that is posted at the bottom of your screen and mark that you attended today's session. The event is being recorded today, and so you can go back and listen to the webinar through the Learn link. And at, um, on the first screen that you saw today, please post your email address, and we will get to you an evaluation link and um, let you know of other available resources through the Child and Family Learning Network. I'm happy to announce that tomorrow we are hosting a Twitter chat about this topic. It sort of continues the discussion um, that is here, held here today for wellness in the workplace. It will be tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And so if you would like more information about that, um, please put your email in the chat box and we'll get that information to you. It's my pleasure to introduce Joanne Keen Kinsey and Kathleen Morgan from the Families Food and Fitness Community of Practice, and they are valued members of the Child and Family Learning Network Executive Team. Joanne is a Family and Community Health Sciences Educator for Rutgers Cooperative Extension Service, and Kathleen is the Department Chair for Family and Com Community Health Sciences at Rutgers University. Joanne and Kathleen are pre present presenters today and will be discussing wellness in the workplace. As a reminder, please mute your phones using the mute button or pressing star six. And if you have any questions or comments, please use the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. And it is great pleasure that I present to you Joanne Kinsey and Kathleen Morgan. Next slide. Good morning to everyone. Can you hear me? I hope you have a good connection. Thank you for joining us for Wellness in the Workplace. Many people have probably heard me say this uh, several times, but a couple of years ago when I was in Washington at the Weight of the Nation Conference, where they had the top professionals in the area of nutrition and health, they said if we were ever to combat obesity, it would be in two places. It would be in work sites and in schools. So I know that some of you who are on this call are probably doing work in both of those places. But when I think of, of, of work sites, the thing that I really love about work sites is that, at least in work sites, it can trickle down in the family or into the community. I'm doing a lot of work in schools, and uh, what I do feel, at least in schools, we're really making great progress with the kids. But a lot of times, the work that we do, it doesn't trickle upward unless we're able to send newsletters or things like that home to the parents. I do feel we do have an advantage in the workplace of having uh, the work that we do there, whether it's helping meals or physical activities, so that that work uh, can uh, trickle down to the family. Next slide. So those of you who are on, the, I know we don't have a lot of participants this morning. I wish we did have more. But when you look at adults or employees, not everyone that we look at are healthy. I would say if we had a whole lot of participants that maybe some of you might be on um, some types of medication, might be on cholesterol lowering medication or hypertensive medication or other types of medication. So it doesn't take much once you get into middle or older adult age that we do need medication uh, for chronic 
illnesses. So the goal is to try to prevent some of those types of illnesses, and that can oftentimes be done through uh, healthy behavior changes, but oftentimes those behaviors can help to be changed through programs like worksite wellnesses. Next slide. So, Joanne and I were very fortunate uh, last year to, um, to get a grant uh, through the uh, New Jersey Department of Health, but it actually came from the CDC. And the goal of it was really to develop a worksite wellness program that would help to decrease um, obesity, but also the risk of heart disease and stroke for New Jersey residents. So you can see that uh, looking at the burden of heart disease and stroke, the workplace really provides a very large audience for cardiovascular disease and stroke prevention activities. So workplace wellness programs are really an important strategy to prevent the major shared risk factors for cardiovascular disease and stroke. So just by initiating a walking program uh, in a workplace, a walking problem itself, if someone came to me and said that they were just diagnosed with uh, mild to moderate hypertension, rather than hope that they were given the medication, by giving them a pair of sneakers and having them walk every day at lunchtime, oftentimes, especially with mild hypertension, could really start to lower that hypertension without them having to go on medication, which oftentimes has uh, serious side effects. Next slide. So one of the things that we would do, if you were going to your um, employer, to ask your employer to really consider um, starting a worksite wellness program, are the things that you would want to do to um, encourage uh, the development of a worksite wellness program is really to present uh, the reason for that and um, why it would be important. And to really look at some of the data for your state. Now, this is New Jersey data, so for those of you who might be from another state, you could look at the uh, Griffiths data or the behavioral, behavioral risk factor surveillance data from your state to really uh, stress the need for that program. Now, you can see here in New Jersey some of those numbers like 38.63 reported having high blood cholesterol. 9.2% had diabetes. 62% here in New Jersey were overweight or obese. I mean, that's a very high number for New Jersey. 51% reported no exercise in the prior 30, 30 days. And the bottom one, 72% ate no fruit and vegetables uh, less than five times a day. So numbers like this, again, while they might seem startling, by having a worksite wellness program, these are the types of behaviors that you can really work on, especially the bottom one, trying to change that behavior of eating more fruits and vegetables during the day in a worksite wellness program by changing uh, the cafeteria offerings, by encouraging them to bring fruits and vegetables for their snacks. So this is one behavior that really can be modified very easily through a worksite wellness program. Next slide. So again, this is uh, New Jersey data, but what you can really do uh, in trying to present your case for a, a worksite wellness program at, at your site is to compare your state data to the national data. Uh, now, ours doesn't look that much different than national data, uh, but depending on what your state might look like, it can really present um, a very good audience or argument as to why um, you should be in initiating a worksite wellness program at your site. Next, next slide, slide, please. So really, work, workplace wellness, why should we care? Today, the major threat to most Americans' health is really chronic, non-communicable disease, such as heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. These illnesses and their underlying causes affect more than 130 million Americans, nearly half of our population. Many of these conditions are linked to unhealthy diets and low levels of activity, and they are highly preventable, as you could see by the previous slide. 
The various analysis of different strategies to reduce the number of deaths and improve the cost effectiveness of interventions have shown to have big payoffs for public health initiatives. There was an analysis done in 2008 that concluded that an investment of $10 per person annually in a website wellness program and community-based public health initiatives would return more than $16 billion within five years or 5.6 per dollar invested. So that's a huge investment um, to uh, our nation and saved healthcare dollars. And that's really what this really gets down to, our saved healthcare dollars. And that's often a really good argument uh, to your uh, employee management uh, when you're trying to invest in a worksite wellness program. Uh, and oftentimes, it doesn't, they're not going to see it right away. It might take a year, it might take a year and a half or two years until they start to see a return on their investment for a worksite wellness program, but it, it can happen. Next slide. So again, employers are wise to invest in worksite wellness programs. And one of the reasons this, again, is a problem that is from uh, tried and true. So primary prevention approaches like those that we've discussed and have been demonstrated effective at slowing the progress of each of these conditions. As I mentioned to you before, diabetes is one of those top chronic uh, diseases. So there's a program that's done nationally, and some of you might be in, be in the wrong state, the Diabetes Prevention Program, for example, has reduced the rate of onset of diabetes among its participants by approximately 58% with even higher rates of success among those who are over the age of 60. So those, those are really startling percent it's, it's over time. And that's one of the programs that's been in place for numerous years. I'm not sure how many years. Probably, I would say, at least 10 years. And it has shown itself trying and true of saving dollars, of improving uh, employees' health, so well, these are the types of programs we know that can make a difference in, in having it be a wise investment for employers to invest in. And again, that could increase the absenteeism, employee turnover, healthcare costs. So at this point, uh, I'm going to turn the program over to Joanne Kinsey, and she will talk to you about developing a culture of wellness in the workplace. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Kathleen. So let's, let's get a little bit more into the strategies of how to actually make this happen in work sites. And um, a lot of what we're going to see today is based on the work that Kathleen and I have been doing and uh, are currently doing with a number of employers throughout New Jersey um, and some ways that we can show some easy successes, you know, down the road for those employers. So. I'll get moving on that. Um, we often talk about a culture of wellness, and we like to use that language when we're speaking with employers. But we want to make sure they understand what it is and what it means, and that it's not a silver bullet. It's not going to make a change in the work site immediately, that it takes some time. Um, you know, we, we have employers that have a whole range of behaviors going on in their workplaces at the time. They may have uh, vending machines that they could do a better job with the selections in them. They may have cafeterias that they know could make some changes in their menu selections and just some of the other behaviors that are going on. And as you can well imagine, these behaviors cannot change easily. There is often a little bit of a pushback from the employee. So things have to be carefully thought out um, and, and sort of created a little bit of a step-by-step -step process, a plan, a work plan we call it, of how to go about making those changes and more importantly making them sustainable. So we try to encourage employers to move from having a variety of activities going on in their work sites that may or may not be tied together um, we, we find that they call us to come in and do a program, and but what else is happening, you know, at the same time in their work site? So we um, we try to get them to really think through how to go about that in a very smart kind of a way. 
So one of the things we encourage um, when we're talking to, let's say, a chamber of commerce or a group of employers or just interested citizens is that we know we are going to face barriers or, you know, real and perceived barriers by the employers. Now, some employers will say, will just, you know, spend lots of time explaining all the barriers they have about doing this. But most of the time, what it really boils down to is that they don't know where to start. And that's where we step in and try to help them develop that plan of how to move about it. Um, one of the things that comes up all the time is budget. And we try, uh, we really work hard to target small employers in our state. Our understanding is that 80% of the employees in our state are employed by small employers. So, you know, that may be an employer that has 100 or less employees working for them. And as you can imagine, those employers have little or no resources to go about developing a program. So we are working, you know, hard at trying to give them ideas and suggestions, showing them where the free resources are and how they can pretty much get started. So we'll just keep on moving here. So what does it look like in a work site? Because employers will want to know that. Well, you know, we feel like we're a pretty well culture in our organization, but then when they take a closer look at it, they realize they could make some changes and do a better job with that. We like to talk about um, some very specific healthy lifestyle behaviors, and obviously nutrition is, is pretty much at the top of the list. And to be very honest with you, um, it's not a difficult sell to employers anymore. They are very interested in these topics as well. They know their employees are interested. Um, sometimes the employer's interest is not where we're coming from. We talk, you know, we're coming from knowing that we need to encourage healthy lifestyle behavior, behavior for the individual. Sometimes the employers come with a different thinking, and that is, we just want to save money, so it's a dollars and cents kind of thing. So we kind of need to find a language that is common between those two different types of thinking. Um, we always want to increase and encourage employees to increase their physical activity because we know we can't just talk about nutrition. We have to talk about increased physical activity at the same time. And we know that being tobacco-free is very important, and we know that that can reduce their health care costs considerably if they have a workforce that is smoking. So exactly what are we talking about? And this is where people in a, an extension nationally, I know they're already doing lots of this work, but, you know, if you're looking for where do I fit into this, hopefully you'll find some ideas here that can uh, give you some insight about just where you do fit in. Of course, we're going to talk about healthy lifestyle, healthy eating behaviors. We're going to talk about fruits and vegetables and the importance of that. We're going to talk about choose my plate and, and what that means and how that relates to their lifestyle. Um, but, and we're going to be also kind of specific about talking about vending machines. seems to be a big issue in a lot of work sites. So we have to be able to, to, to talk about that and how to either – identify health, healthy options, or actually this question comes up more than anything, how do I talk to my vendors um, for my vending machines about how to make those changes? It seems to be a, a little bit of an issue sometimes with employers being a little bit hesitant to have that conversation. But then when they do have the conversation, they find that there are some simple changes that can be made. And of course, um, this wouldn't be in a, in a small employer setting, but in a large employer where they have a cafeteria available, then what kind of options do we have there and how can we identify those healthier options? So at the same time, for other employees who don't have access to a cafeteria, we want to talk about what you can bring for lunch yourself from home, what, what it might look like in that bag that you're bringing in, and um, also we want to talk about the kinds of beverages that they're drinking throughout the day and try to encourage the consumption of water and not sugar-sweetened beverages. Our employers, many of them that we are working with, are already involved in some community events, especially the larger employers. The smaller employers 
are pretty hesitant with that type of thing because they really don't know how to get involved. And of course, they don't want it to cost them any money to get their employees involved. But there are suggestions that we can make about um, having walking programs and encouraging walking during lunchtime or break time, uh, maybe designing a walking path, uh, you know, really just outlining an area on the outside of the building at times and sometimes in a, a large employer on the inside of the building and just giving people some encouragement to go and do more of that, just simple things like walking. We know that lots of our employers do know how to have the conversation with local gyms to establish uh, reduced cost gym memberships for their employees. And in, in the uh, experience that I have in talking with local gyms, they are very willing to come into the work site for no cost and conduct programs. And of course, they're going to be willing to try to make a deal with the employer in terms of you know, encouraging people to sign up for gym memberships. Of course, tobacco, we know this is a huge issue and I'm not sure what the numbers look like in your state, but in our state around 19% of adults are smoking, which I know is greatly reduced over the years. However, it still is a considerable number of people that we need to, um, to talk to. And we find that employees, even if they are non-smokers, are very interested in learning about smoking and getting more information about that um, in order to protect themselves and protect their family and so on. Some employers will even offer smoking cessation programs, and if we can help them make the connection to the organizations that can do that type of program, programming, we certainly um, do that as much as we can. And we can't talk about health in the workplace or wellness without addressing emotional health. We have to address this. In fact, I have to say the number one reason that employers will contact us and ask for assistance, ask for programming, is about stress management. Employers realize their employees are very stressed. And when we, we do our little, um, um, like a pre-survey with employees, we can actually identify how many times a week the employees are feeling stressed. And a stressed workforce is not a productive workforce. So um, although this is what really brings us to the table very often, we need to make sure we can talk the language with the employer who is stressed themselves about productivity and that kind of thing and letting them know that there, we can make a difference here. This is a topic that we can certainly talk about with employees and help to give them some really simple strategies to um, live a little bit of a stress-less lifestyle. Of course, we need to talk about preventative care. And um, a lot of the vendors that are out there in the healthcare industry, the local hospitals that we work with and some other organizations are, you know, very willing to come to the table and talk about preventative care and in some cases provide free screenings, you know, perhaps through our local health departments and uh, screenings through their hospitals as well. So we encourage that conversation as well because we know the local institutions are willing to help out with that. And lots of times it's really just a matter of making the connection for the employer between um, the needs they have and the resources that already exist in their community. So let's um, get into what can be a little bit of a touchy subject. I can tell you that sometimes we are contacted by the CEO of an organization saying, um, I need some help with this, can you help us? But very often that request will come from a middle management type of area. Very often it comes from human resources. If it's a large organization, it may come from the benefits people because they see those numbers in terms of health care claims and want to know how they can make a difference. Regardless of who comes to us and looks for assistance, we know that we have to have the, the buy-in and the support of the senior level management for any program to be successful because they must be able to say, 
we're willing to do this work, we're willing to invest time, if not money, in a program because we know it's important. So very often, we have to help the HR people um, put together a little presentation, give them some local data and that type of thing that they can take into the high-level management to convince them that something needs to be done in that particular work setting. Before you or um, people that you uh, solicit to help you with this type of endeavor, you need to think about what are the questions that the CEO or senior level management is going to ask when you walk in the door. Because if you, if you go to them knowing your story and what you need to present, that's one thing. And certainly that's half the battle. But the other part is they are going to be asking you questions about how much it's going to cost me. How do I know if there's going to be change? How are we going to get our employees to participate? What if our employees don't participate? You know, it, it's kind of a, it's not a one conversation type of issue to sit down and figure these, that, these types of questions and answers out with senior management. There needs to be a little bit of an ongoing conversation. And usually not just between us and the management. We also need the support of HR, perhaps benefits, and perhaps a couple of people on the staff who are respected and tend to be what we call wellness champions, people who are very interested in improving the wellness in their organizations. It's very important to just identify what are the types of issues that need to be addressed in this particular organization because, as you can imagine, those issues are different from one organization to the next. So in, uh, in one setting, the issue may be we really need to deal with stress. In another setting, it may need to be we have a lot of smokers and we need to deal with tobacco. So there needs to be a lot of conversation um, um, and perhaps what we like to do in our institution is we like to um, do a, an employer needs assessment so they can take a look at what are we doing in terms of wellness and then they and hopefully a wellness committee can sit down and say, here's what we're doing, now what do we really need to do next and help them identify where they need to go. If a senior level management person is the type of person that, that jogs every day and makes time to go to a fitness center or something like that, then the buy-in will be pretty easy from them. But sometimes uh, those schedules are a little too busy and maybe we need to convince the senior level management that we need to all be interested in this. And it usually boils down to dollars and cents. So if someone in the organization can say, hey, our health care claims are just getting higher and higher all the time, that will probably get senior level management to pay closer attention. Whatever it takes, we'd like to have that conversation. Healthcare uh, claims data is very important, and I'm not sure how it works in your state or in your situation, but um, the entities in our state that are covered by our state health benefits programs, they have a difficult time getting their individual organization um, health care claims data. I don't know why that happens. Hopefully there will be changes in that in the coming days where that data can be transferred a little bit more easily. But when employers actually see that data, they are very willing to come to the table and have a conversation. Kathleen talked a little bit about return on investment. And um, this is sometimes a little bit of a touchy issue because you'll see if you take a look at some of the research that's been out there for several years that the return on investment numbers vary greatly um, depending on who, you know, put together those numbers and did that particular research. So with an employer, they're not going to see a return on investment immediately. This is going to take time. They're going to have to actually track the behavior and the health care claims of their employees to see the change. So you can imagine that that's going to take a bit of time. That may take a couple of years to actually see the difference. 
but they will see some things uh, changed in their workforce that can happen pretty quickly in terms of absenteeism and productivity and morale because a healthier workforce is going to be a happier workforce as well, and they're going to be much more productive. For employers that have no resources or very little resources, then we want to help them find the no-cost or um, low-cost programs that are right there in their neighborhoods already or right here in the state that we might be able to help them make connections with. So the bottom line is, of course, the more that is put into wellness in a work, in a work site, then um, in the end, less money will be spent on health care claims. And as I said, that's going to take a little bit of time. So we just need to help them move from one step to the other and help them understand that it's not going to happen overnight. One of the first steps we do, um, aside from perhaps asking employers to do an um, employer needs assessment, which is also known as the CDC's Worksite Health Scorecard, which you probably are already uh, familiar with. And if you're not, you can find that on the CDC's website. What we did for the development of New Jersey's Worksite Wellness Toolkit last year was we digitized the survey and put it on SurveyMonkey so that our employers that are participating in our programs can easily complete the survey, and can see their own results. So um, we may talk about that a little bit more down the road here. But we encourage employers, no matter large institution, small institution, to put together a wellness committee. And um, it's kind of interesting that we work with employers that have had wellness committees for many years. And yet, through conversation with them in the past year, they've been able to take a, a closer look at their wellness committee, invite some additional employees into the committee, and they're very pleased to say that they found that more employees are interested in joining the committee today. So uh, even if they've had a committee for a long time, we try to see if we can help them identify where they can make some, change, some changes. In small employers, we find that one person wears many hats. Um, very often, like we do in our organizations, that we wear many hats sometimes. But your CEO could be the HR person, um, or HR could be payroll and um, doing some other types of management. So we want to make sure we include some of these people on our wellness committee as well. But we want to look for those wellness champions, too, because they are the people that have the motivation and the interest to help move the organization along. So um, to take a look at what should a committee look like, who should be on the committee, definitely have to have management, obviously, because if you're going to be looking to changing policy or environment in an organization, and we need to have those people on board. Of course, your HR people will be there. You need somebody in a supervisory position at some level, and whoever surfaces as wellness champions. And as I said, some employers will put out a, you know, an all call to the organization and ask who would be interested in being on a wellness committee. And um, others will maybe invite a couple people in to get the ball rolling. We ask them and sometimes actually help them to convene a meeting to get started with the process. So in our work, we've used two assessments. I told you about the employer needs assessment, which is the CDC's Worksite Health Scorecard. And then we also developed um, what we call our Employee Baseline Behavior and Interest Survey so that we can ask employees um, how many fruits and vegetables are eating a day, uh, how much sugar-sweetened beverages, the amount of physical activity, about smoking, about stress. But we can also ask them what their interests are in terms of wellness, and we can ask them how they would like to learn or have additional information about wellness. So between those two assessments, we are able to get a tremendous amount of information and really 
you know, once they once an organization takes a look at those two assessments, they pretty easily see where their first steps are and their direction about where they need to go. We like to encourage our employers to um, do a couple of things. One, brainstorm as a committee what the health issues or wellness issues are in their organization. And they may find that there are a number of issues that will surface. Very often, way more issues than they can, they can deal with in a short period of time. Um, but we also ask them to take that brainstorm session and then convert it into a realistic work plan. What are we going to dress? What is most important? What comes to the top of the list? And develop their own strategic plan about how to go about doing that. Um, this is a very important step for them because they can be overwhelmed by the amount of ideas that surface from a committee and have no idea about where to start. So finding, you know, maybe it's the low-hanging fruit in a way. You know, maybe it's something that they can do. They can see a quick response. They can determine if employees are interested. Something to just get them started um, is usually the best place to go. They definitely need to prioritize what their work will be. And they should think about what can we accomplish in six months to a year. They shouldn't try to do everything at one time because you know what's going to happen and they won't be successful with anything. But they should identify, here's our starting point, here's what we expect to see in three months or six months or a year down the road, and then they can address other issues um, as time moves along. One of the things that's important to remember is that uh, there are so many community-based efforts already going on in our states. Here in our state, we have Main Street projects. We have lots of business district work going on. We have community transformation areas um, and grants that are happening in a variety of areas. And by working with them, collaborating with them, we're able to extend our reach a little bit more too. So we know that these groups are already looking at walking paths and um, bike paths to work and purchasing bike rack racks and that kinds of things. We see more and more farmers markets um, in work in, an, in urban areas and even coming into work sites in New Jersey, which is very exciting. Now, they may be the medium to large employers that they would come into on a weekly basis, but we see a lot of success with that. So if we're able to help bridge that gap between how do we get the farmer's markets to come to the table, then we obviously would help them do that. So we need to know what's already happening in your community and how can we leverage their efforts and our efforts together to get the maximum um, return for our employers. So just a few quick words about our assessments. There are lots of health risk assessments out there. Some have no cost and some have a very high cost and obviously your larger organizations can afford to pay for the higher cost ones. We wanted to put together something that our employers can use when they when there is no cost involved at all. And we do want them to highlight what the strengths are in their programming and we want them to take a look at where are the areas in need, like where are those gaps. And by, by doing this, it kind of, you can almost see the light bulbs going off in their head. You know, oh my goodness, well, we haven't done anything with smoking, so maybe we need to do something there. Or maybe by doing the assessment, they say, well, you know, we haven't done anything at all, so we certainly need to start someplace. Here is um, the CDC Worksite Health Scorecard. If you're not familiar with it, you can find it on their website. It is a fairly long survey. Um, it goes into great detail, but for the most part, the questions are yes or no. Have you conducted cancer prevention programs in your worksite in the past six or 12 months? So, you know, they're yes or no questions. So it doesn't take a long time for our employers to complete that survey. And if we need to, we'll help them to walk through it. 
as I said with the employee survey, we want to get a little bit of a feeling from them about where their interests lie, how they want information, and um, a, a very importantly about what their current behavior is. Because as you can imagine, down the road at the end of perhaps a year's time or at the end of a series of programming that will help them with, we want to know if they have changed their behavior. So it's easy for us to identify changes if we take that baseline information so that we have something to compare it with down the road. The employers that we work with are very interested in having that data as soon as it's available. And um, I respond to them when they request the data or at the end of a certain period of time, you know, uh, okay, we put out a, a pre-survey and we gave the employees two weeks to do it or a week to do it. Then we'll report that data back to the employer at that time and continue to give them access to that data as we move through the program. So what about the cost of resources? Um, it, you know, it really depends on, on how much you want to put into it, obviously, but we are seeing success with no money exchanged at all. So what could be the, the low-cost resources? Getting the Wellness Committee. Does it cost the employer in terms of a little bit of time from their employees? It does, but not a tremendous amount of time. A wellness committee, committee can meet monthly, so it's not a huge commitment on the part of the employer or amount of time that they are investing for the work that can be done. We know um, through a lot of the work that we're doing in Extension and our health departments and some of our hospitals that we can get lots of programming out there for no cost at all. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, obviously, newsletters and email, we, we put information out that way. We have a program that we are currently doing that, a full year program. Our Get Moving, Get Healthy New Jersey program um, for the workforce is putting out weekly messages to employees and also to their employers about healthy lifestyle and messages and resource-based length and that type of thing. Something that may cost a little bit more could be um, if they really get involved in wellness committee meetings, if they wanted to have them every other week or something like that, and perhaps bringing someone in to speak about some various topics or even having a health fair. Um, in talking to some of our employers, I was really amazed to find that there are some um, hospital systems that have a pretty high, high price tag on conducting a health fair at the work site. A few other uh, medium cost resources could be screenings and uh, doing some health risk assessments or bringing in your weight management programs. Something that may be a high cost program, um, and we've seen employers that have a gym on site that have um, another employer that has uh, converted a meeting room to a walking meeting room where they have two treadmills side by side. So obviously these have a, a price tag to them for employers who can't afford to do that type of work. Maybe they are providing gym memberships to the families as well. But no matter what we're doing, it always starts with that very first step. You know, think about where is the easiest, the lowest point that we can start? And it seems by gathering some information from the employer about what they've done and from the employees that that seems to be a good starting point so that we can determine where their next steps would be, help them to brainstorm, um, help them to prioritize their goal, and perhaps even make suggestions about where they can start to begin some of that programming. I know we're, we're pretty short on time here, Katie, so um, if we have questions, maybe this is a good time to, to have some questions. The floor is open for anybody that wants to um, ask a question, and you can also use your chat box. I wasn't able to keep an eye on the chat box earlier, so if there are questions that came up, if you could just share them with me, that would be great.
Oh, I see that Nicole posted the um, the Worksite Health Scorecard. You definitely want to take a look at that if you're not familiar. Um, I see Nicole's question. Can you speak to the systemic effects of workplace and family wellness? Um, well, I think Kathleen said something very early in the presentation about by talking to employees or adults that they carry that information home with them and we certainly want that to happen. Um, in some cases, depending on what the employer would like, we can send those weekly messages to the employees at the work site and we can ask them to sign up and send them to their home email address so we know the message is getting home at that point in time and we really do, do encourage that. Um, we want, in the end, I mean in the perfect world, to have healthier communities. And in working in that direction, we know that it needs to start very often in, in the family or in the individual. Help them to have some strategies, very family-friendly strategies about how do I pack a healthier lunch for my family? You know, um, how do I get them to drink more water and have less sugar? You know, how do we plan family outings that include some physical activity in, in the day? And um, at least throughout the work we're doing in our weekly messages and our healthy on the job work place wellness newsletter, we make those recommendations and suggest ideas for employees to take home and not just um, do in their workplace, but also to take home and encourage with their family as well. So I hope I answered that question, Nicole. I see there's another question here. Um, are employees that we're working with offered um, incentives in terms of money? Well, that's a really great question, Barbara. We see a variety, you know, a continuum of, of uh, ideas going across the board. When employers are offering incentives in terms of money or time off from work, employees come to the table and participate. Right now, we're doing a program um, in one of the counties, and 500 people signed up very quickly for the program because the employer, the county, is offering 50 personal days, like a free personal day. So of the 500 people who signed up in the end, complete the survey, complete the program, and so on, 50 people will receive an, receive an extra day off. This brings people to the table. And uh, in conversations with additional employers, they are more willing to do that because they feel that it doesn't cost them out-of-pocket money to do that type of thing. So um, thank you for that question, and I, I hope I answered that correctly or <laughs> enough for you. Well, if there's not any more questions, um, I'd like to take this moment and thank Kathleen and Joanne for their wonderful presentation. And we also thank you for joining us and, and being so patient with us in the beginning as we had some technology issues. Um, but I encourage you to keep the conversation going and join us tomorrow afternoon at 1 p.m. for our Twitter chat. And um, thank you for those who have entered in your uh, email address into the chat box. I will be sending you um, our promotional flyer that has all the instructions and the questions that we will be addressing during the hour-long Twitter chat. And again, I thank you for joining us today. And if there are no further questions, I hope everyone has a wonderful day.